Our next guest on Cork Stories is entrepreneur Graham McCormick. So thank you so much for coming into us today, Graham. Thank you, Izzy. Thanks for the invite. You're very welcome. Um, now to talk about things, like we both have a smile on our face right now, but you know we're doing this for Mental Health Awareness Week and you've decided to tell us your story. And I know it's a long a uh, sad story for you um, and we were talking to it before talking about it before we got started but I just wanted to ask you like you mentioned there that like things I suppose maybe took a turn for you when you were seven when do you remember feeling unhappy or that you just weren't feeling right in yourself it was at seven it really was I was in an all boys primary school I would be woken up in the morning by my parents, you know, come on, let's go to school or whatever. And I would just try and pull as many sickies as I could or try and resist it as much as possible because I didn't open my mouth as to what was actually going on in school, which was I was being bullied. Mm. Um, I just didn't open my mouth, really. And my parents were just thought I was a bit of a, a brat. <laughs> really. Yeah. You know, uh, for lack of a better term. But, you know, I was being bullied in school and it's not like you see in movies where they turn you upside down for your lunch money it's you know it's the sly digs in the hall when they're mm. passing you you're on the way to class and stuff like that it was you know it was horrible really yeah you know? and that's tough as well because you know I remember school and I had my fair share of being a bully and bullied as well mm-hmm. Um, and when you're that age you know you're so insecure anyway because you don't know yourself you know we're all that's the thing that's the thing here like we're all trying to figure out who we are so we can make better decisions for ourselves and and we go no I know myself now I I won't do this and this is what's good for me but at that age you don't know who you are you don't know who you should be friends with you know this person's nice to you one day this person's not nice to you another day and it can completely feck with your head yeah it can and for me, even at that point, as you said, you know, we're just kind of coming into ourselves, you mm. know, obviously further down the line with teens, it gets different. But at that age, my actual first kind of conscious awareness of being human and feeling was feeling like crap from being mm. bullied. And, you know, that it almost stained me and carried on, you know, from, from yeah. that point on. I mean, that was seven. At that point as well, uh, my brother, my older brother was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when he was 16. I was just seven. And given a 50-50 chance of survival due to his age and of course you know with the old negativity bias in the brain we kind of tend to focus on the negative so yes. I focus on the fact that he was going to die even though yeah. it was a 50-50 chance so there was that there was you know the bullying I just didn't feel too good even at, at that point you know mm. and it carried on the bullying carried on till you know I went in actually carried on all through primary um, to the point where I turned 11 and I tried drugs for the first time to kind of numb what was going on because I just felt like absolute crap. Mm. I didn't know I was actually being bullied. I didn't know I was bullying. Mm. All I knew was that words didn't just hurt. They really, really hurt. Mm. And I, you know, I have a sensitive nature. And later on in life, I found that out due mm-hmm. to my diagnosis. But, you know, at that point, it, I just felt like crap. Yeah. Mm. And so you're saying that, I suppose, maybe since seven, discovering that you weren't feeling as happy as you thought you should be. It was just a roller coaster until you hit what point where you went, okay, this is becoming a lot for me now. I need to seek help. It was at 13. Um, I was in secondary school and the majority of people that were in my primary ended up in my secondary. So you can kind of imagine yeah. bullying just carried on really. Uh, I was 13. I got so angry um, that I made a list of people that I wanted to hurt badly. Uh, my parents found the list. They knew that I was something was serious was going on inside me because I wasn't verbalizing it mm. um, due to I'm a man and you know men don't talk. Mm. That's uh, but I was going to say that because sorry just to interrupt you because yeah. it, I suppose you know we're talking about this so much today, which is trying to get the word out there for people to talk to one another, and it's like you were just suffering in silence so much, and did you just feel that you couldn't talk to anyone and nobody would understand it? There was a lot going on. Mm. Um, I suppose it was the kind of male thing, you know, it's societal, you know, judgment saying, you know, men shouldn't talk or men should be a bit tougher, mm. you know. Uh, that's bullshit, by the way. Mm. Um, I believe that. I fully believe that wasn't just a thought in my head. I fully believe that. Um, I also was a bit naive that I felt I could handle a bit more than what I was experiencing. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was a bit of, yeah, there was definitely naive at points. Um, and fear of judgment was a huge one. Mm-hmm. Oh, Graham's broken. Um, no, I'm not. I'm just feeling a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And there's a lot of that going on, so I just internalised everything. And if you internalise everything enough, you're going to, something's going to happen. You're going to explode somehow. Yeah. Um. So parents from the list brought me to a psychiatrist. He said, look, 
he's going to have to stop taking drinking drugs or he'll end up you know with severe mental health um, mm-hmm. pretty early so at that point I didn't care because I started to believe everything that bullies were saying about me and I formed what's called self-hatred mm-hmm. so I didn't care at all so that carried on and at 16 I was expelled from secondary school again acting out of, of what I was feeling and I was put into rehab because other secondary schools wouldn't take me over the severity of what I did to get expelled mm-hmm. so that was 16 I lasted a week and a half up in Kilkenny in Ballyragget um, just came back you know my parents collected me actually up there and they had that look of disappointment that they had when I got expelled from school in the principal's office they were just like you know it was a look of kind of disappointment, but it was always also a look of like, what do I do with my child here? Mm. I just don't know. Yeah. You know, I'm a parent now and it's pretty hard. Yeah, I was just about to say, because you look back as you get older at, um, you know, your parents and how they raised you. And like, I don't have kids, but I now have sympathy for my parents because I'm assuming that it's a tough job. You just <laughs> expect your child to be to like school and to yeah. be this certain way. And then, you know, they could just turn around and say, well, actually, I don't like doing that. And then you're like, oh, what am I supposed to do here now? Mm. You know? Yeah. It's like, from what I can see myself as a parent, it, and you just touch on it there, it's the expectation. Yeah. Expectation gets you hurt. So mm. if you withdraw the expectation and leave them in their process, you know, all you can do is just be there for them. Yeah. And that's what my parents were. Um, they were a bit bamboozled at points because I just wasn't talking and I was yeah. acting out. But, you know, at that point, just to come back to the story then as well, at that point, you know, a week and a half in rehab at 16 and just came back home and continued to use alcohol and drugs as a form of self-medicating, really. Mm. And I was always the one within the gang to go too far yeah. with drinking drugs. Like, late teens kind of dabbling or whatever it's it's almost normal now at this point and unfortunately it is um but i was always the one to go too far mm. would take way too many drugs would be you know brought home in an ambulance or, or sorry brought ho- brought to the hospital in an ambulance or brought home by the guards it was you know graham's gone c- completely off the wall here i was always just a glutton for it really um and you know behind the word glutton was me trying to numb everything that was going on mm. you know and at 18 then, I was in a relationship, my partner became pregnant, and at 19 my daughter was born, and throughout the entire pregnancy I was just like, you're going to be a terrible dad here, you know that, like, you can't even look after yourself, how do you expect to look after another human being, so, at that point, I let my thoughts get the best of me, I didn't verbalise anything, I internalised everything, and I exploded, and I tried it in my life at 19, to which I was put into the psychiatric ward, um, left there for about six weeks really either you know first I was pummeled with medication and I was just left there either really hungry or really tired or sometimes both and it was horrendous mm. it's pretty much a blur yeah. and would you say that that was that point in your life where you said I need to do something here now or else like you know I'm I'm supposed to be dead here like in a way yeah um, when I was released from the psychiatric ward after that six week stay, they bumped up my medication completely. So I remember about two or three months after that, I came out of the shower and I just looked at my body and I put on serious weight from the medication. I was just like, oh no, like, you know, I goes mentally, you're clearly still not well. And now physically you're becoming unwell. You know, I hit yeah, a crossroads. And your mind was, is spiraling and taking everything and making you feel like a horrible person. And that's something I was talking to Pat about um a while ago. Um what's it called again? It's is it called catas- catastrophizing, catastrophizing. Yeah. Such a hard word to say. Mm-hmm. Um and we all do it. And you know, obviously in your case you had a lot going on with you, but it's such an everyday thing that people do to themselves all the time you know it's like you have one bad thing and all of a sudden you're having the worst you're having the worst day ever Mm. you know one or two bad things could happen to you and then your brain just goes oh my god what's going on here and you end up just spiralling yeah so like that's that's all due to the negativity bias of your brain there's literally a part of your brain that focuses on the negative And then catastrophizing and even expanded thinking, they all come from that. Mm. So like catastrophizing But we're programmed to think like that. Isn't that correct? Like as in, you know, say back to like olden days, it was like the fight or flight simulation in your brain. So we're, because we were going to be attacked, you know what I mean? But now your brain is thinking that it's constantly going to be attacked all the time and that's how you get anxious or... You think negative. It is, yeah. Like, we're, we're still we're still programmed by the primal brain. Mm. You just touched on it there, caveman times. Mm. You know, even judgment, the aspect of judging 
comes from caveman times you have to judge an experience as safe or not and if you judge as judged it as not safe then fight or flight will kick in yeah I need to run or fight this saber tooth tiger. Yeah. No, that's fine. It kept us alive. It's it's part of our brain to keep us alive. But in current times, it makes us suffer greatly. I was just about to say, and like a word that I've learned this year is like, it just doesn't serve you anymore. And like that, you could put that towards, you know, some people hate public speaking, you know, so they'd fly away from that because it's just, that's danger, danger, danger. That's out mm-hmm. of your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Um, And there's so many things that people don't do because of that in your brain, you know? Yeah, but you can stop all that with a question. Yeah. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah. I'm not going to get eaten here by a saber-toothed tiger. I might freeze and maybe one or two judgmental people in, a, in an audience of 300 might go, mm. and why are you letting t- the opinion of two or three people affect you mm. as a person? Do you not have your inner power? Do you not stand in your truth? Yeah. Do you not stand tall on your own two feet? Yeah. No, then that's okay too. Yeah. <laughs> and a big thing as well is, um, what I like to do as well is, if I if my head starts going, um. I ask myself, is this is this a rational thought? Yeah. Because that's another thing that we do all the time. You know, all of a sudden you might think something and think, why did that pop into my head? And then all of a sudden you've been thinking about it for an hour and you've just, you're going, why have I just done that to myself? I don't need to, that doesn't serve me to think about that right now. It's not going to change my life. Why are we worrying about that? Or why are we getting stressed or anxious about that? Yeah. It, it's that, it, again, the negativity way is just going straight to the negative and going, this is horrendous. Mm. So basically when you do that, when you're picturing worst case scenario, it's basically the negative what if game. Mm. But you can turn that on its head and play the positive what if game. Yeah. You know, what if something good happens in this situation? You know, and then yeah. once you ask yourself that question where your thoughts go, energy flows, then another question might pop up. Mm. Uh, a good feeling thought might come up. And then naturally it might go back to the negative. But you control your thoughts. You can gently guide it back again to mm-hmm. a good feeling one and stay there. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and just back to your story because obviously we drifted there a bit but it's, it's you, you've, you've learned so much obviously because you're sitting in front of me now and we're having a conversation about, you know, changing your brain and how thinking positively once you've unlocked that tool at the right place in your life where you want to think about it more and you're woke, which is the 2019 phrase, you know woke what I mean? Woke uh, AF, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Out, so you obviously are. So, how did you get to that place? Okay, so I like to say that I'm an expert, mm-hmm. and I'm an expert in my life and my life only. I'm an yeah. expert in me. Okay, so anything I ever say comes from my own experience. Um, so in 2014, I just to keep you up to date. I was after my second suicide attempt. Mm-hmm. I was back in the psychiatric ward for the fifth time at this point. And sorry, just at this stage, yeah. had you um, seeked help from Pieta? Or at that point, no, not no. yet. No. So from there, I went into the psychiatric ward again. Okay, fifth time there. My psychiatrist was just like, I've had enough of you coming here really like in an indirect manner. She was mm-hmm. like, I'm diagnosing you with emotionally unstable personality disorder. Mm-hmm. To which I went, no shit. I know. <laughs> I know I'm emotionally unstable. Um, thanks for the label though. So I went back to bed, crying, my eyes out, formed the belief that I'd be emotionally unstable for the rest of my life. So again, in there, I think that I was in there this time for about eight weeks. I was left go. I had to see my psychiatrist pretty much straight away. So I went over to Raven's Court. I seen her. I chatted to her. She said, look, there's a diagnosis. Di- there's a, a therapy specific to your diagnosis, and it's called dialectical behavior therapy, DBT for short. It's similar enough to CBT, which is cognitive yeah. behavior therapy. So DBT is specific to someone who would have my disorder. It's mm-hmm. a bit, bit different than CBT. There's a few extra skills and stuff like that. So I started that. It was a year-long program. I had to sign a contract first, though, that if I became suicidal on the course, that I would not seek help. To which, to which I went, do you want me to die or what's going on here? Um, she said, no, I don't want you to die at all. Mm. She said that basically what was going on there, that I would learn skills on the therapy to introduce when I am suicidal because I had a habit of going straight a I I want to die. I'm trying to kill myself. I've just either attempted to kill myself or something like that back in the psychiatric ward. It's like someone who would hit the prison system and it's just, it's a revolving door. They're mm-hmm. out, they're in, they're out, they're in. That was me with the psychiatric ward. I was mm. constantly in there. Sorry, can I just ask a question? When you were attempting... Uh, to kill yourself and end your life was that a cry for help or did you want to die okay so I've tried to end my life five times Mm -hmm. three of them were genuine suicide attempts as in I wanted off planet earth that's it the other two were cries for help and I'll openly admit that Mm -hmm. I had 
big challenges were verbalizing what was going on inside of me, so I acted out. Yeah. I put it in my behavior. Mm-hmm. Here's me grabbing something sharp and attacking myself. You know, I, I need help here. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to ask for help. Um. So yeah, three of them were, two of them were, were cries for help. Mm-hmm. So, so, and to the story again, just, just back to that point. So signed the contract, that's fine. Started the therapy and it was mindfulness based. And the very first thing that I did with my, my psychotherapist and my one-to-one session was mindfulness. So sat down, she asked me to gently close my eyes and yeah, 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 yeah. 30 seconds, I had to pop straight back out. I was like, nope, not a hope. She was like, what's going on for you? And I was like, uh, I just, you know, what's going on in my head is, going, is what's going on for me. It's horrible inside there. And she said, that's, that's a judgment. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh. You know, straight away, she was like, that's a judgment. She had no reaction. Normally, when I, when I was speaking to someone, saying, inside my head is crazy. Ah. Everyone would be like, oh my God, he's so unwell. She mm. was just like, why, that, yeah, why that, are you judging yourself? Yeah. You know, it is what it is. Like, I was like, oh, that's a new reaction. Yeah. Um, and normalizing it. Yeah. Yeah. It, absolutely. It's just like, okay, like, it's fine, you know. And from there, I just continued. I signed a contract to say basically if anything was getting too challenging for me that I would still continue anyway or put mm-hmm. the effort in. So I did. And after about nine months of mindfulness, almost daily because we had weekly homework, um, learning interpersonal effectiveness skills, distress, tolerance skills, crisis, intervention, everything. I had a trigger and it was my mother on that, on that time. Nine months in, I was just at home one day. My mother done something and I got really 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 angry within like a split second I got to rage straight away and then they had this thought I was like oh look at you getting so angry with your mother you're a f- scumbag how can you get angry with your own mm. mother and I was like oh so I went from anger to shame straight away mm. and then after I felt that shame I felt an urge to self-harm which is normally what I did I'd normally feel an intense emotion I'd either go straight to drinking drugs or I'd go straight to self-harm and that day, I felt an urge to go straight to self-harm. Mm. But I never once, in nine months, or even, how old was I? I was about 24, 25 at this point. Never once did I realize I had a choice in that. Because after the urge, once you realize you, there's an urge coming up, then you understand you have a choice. I can either follow the urge, or I can surf the urge until mm. it goes back down. And such a big thing is, it's all about how you react to circumstances. Because sometimes you can't help things. Like, some things are out of your control. And it's about how you can train yourself to go okay that horrible thing is, is has just happened to me or maybe that's you know maybe something hor- horrible hasn't happened to you but you've just been triggered mm. and then you need to and this obviously is with help and with tools and mm. when what you've learned is that you have to turn around and go okay do I want to lash out get really angry cause myself harm or mm. you know give myself a headache or something like that or do I want to deal with this better so that I can get through my day and just go on about my day. This was just a little blip that happened and I handled it correctly and breathe and get on with it. Absolutely. Mm. Literally just everything you've said just down to simpler terms is you can either react or respond. Yeah. React or respond. Now, react is habitual. It's something that you've done before that has served you in some way. It's literally in it. Reacting. Mm. Reacting what you used to always do. Yes. So my reaction would be to go to self-harm. But thankfully through mindful awareness and living a mindful life for nine months... I became aware of the urge at its earliest stage. It came up Mm. and I chose to respond that day. Mm. What I did that day was I implemented the skills that I was learning on the course. Yeah. I went away and I stuck my head into freezing cold water in a sink. I shocked myself out of intense emotion. I had to. Mm. That's what I was always doing. Or I would put an ice pack on the back of my neck. Just to cool yourself down. Yeah, just to really focus. It's mindfulness. Focus on the sensation of that. Mm. Not how bad I'm feeling or how intense this emotion is Mm. because that just inflames it. Or the other one was to go outside the door and expend that energy somehow and I live on a hill and normally I would get really really angry and I'd go out sprinting the hill up and down my neighbours w- would be looking out going oh Christ grabs out of the kid you know it was just yeah. I had to I, I, like for me I had to expend that energy somehow yeah but so. it's it. I, I love what you're saying because it's such an important message that education is key here and like because I've done I've gone to a lot of CBT talks as well and I love it I think it's so interesting and there is a little bit of homework in it but it's like it's so good for you because there's so many people that I know and they're like oh yeah I totally want to change myself and then I'm like okay well would you do this or would you try that and it's like oh no 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 I don't want to do anything and you have to just commit you have Mm. to commit to wanting to make yourself better yeah (laughs) look 
I'll give you a phrase, okay? Mm. So, you know the phrase, knowledge is power, yeah? Mm -hmm. We all know that. Yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> knowledge is only power when it's applied. Yes. Otherwise, yeah. it means nothing. You can go to all the CBD talks you want, CBT talks you want, all the workshops, read all the books, listen to all the podcasts. That's fine. But if it's not implemented into your life, it's just stored knowledge. Mm. That's yes. it. And it means nothing. You have to take action on these. Otherwise, if you don't, if look, if, if what's the phrase, something about change, but if you don't implement some form of action or something different than what you, you normally do, things are going to stay the same. Yes. And unfortunately, I was like that and I kept complaining. And, it, and I was there like, you, you, why are you complaining? You're not taking any action. Yeah. You're getting the same results all the time and you're still complaining. Mm. Direct that energy away from complaining and towards action. Mm. It's energy management, my friend. Graham, I could speak to you all day, um, but we must wrap things up now. Um, if you had a message for anyone that's watching this right now that is going through something, be it depression, anxiety, whatever you want to call it, because we were saying that before this started, that, you know, you know, it's not just dep depression and it's not just anxiety. There can be completely other things going on with you mm -hmm. and that's okay. And I'm doing this podcast because I want people to talk to each other more and keep the conversation going. Um, we know you went to uh, Pieta House and you've done a lot of work with them. So if you could say to anyone, what would be the first step to making themselves feel better? What would it be? Okay, so first of all, it's just acknowledging how you're feeling. If you're feeling like crap, that's okay. Genuinely, mm -hmm. I like this phrase that I came, I came up with it a um, couple of couple of weeks back at a workshop, and it just came to me. And I was like, okay, if you're genuinely okay with not being okay, everything will be okay. Yes, and live that. And I'm not talking this false as now saying, oh, I'm okay with this anxiety, and then just mm. you know in the background trying to push it away and not mm -hmm. feel it. No, no, be genuinely okay with not being okay, and you'll be okay. Mm. That's step one. Step two is your current situation is not your final destination. If there's one thing in life is an absolute fact, it's change. Mm -hmm. Night turns into day, day turns back into night, the weather changes, your thought changes, your mood changes, your 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 emotions, your feelings, everything changes. If you're in an intense emotion, it feels like it's gonna last forever. Mm. But I'd like you to just question that mm -hmm. because it will not. Sit with it, be okay with it, believe that it will change. The other is don't be na naive like I was and think you're stronger than you are. Um, that's that's a major challenge. So basically, how you're feeling, express it to someone. You can express what's going on inside you without even opening your mouth. You can draw how you're feeling. Mm. You can write about how you're feeling. There's plenty of ways of expressing yourself instead of putting all the pressure. You have to talk. No, you just have to express how you're feeling. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to talk, find someone who's not judgmental, who isn't going to sit up on their high horse and tell you how you should or should not feel. Okay, find someone that's make, going to make your, your feelings valid. And last lastly is, I love you. <laughs> that's it. Mm. You matter. Oh, that's, that's so nice. Graham McCormick, thank you so much for taking the time out today to pop into us here in Red FM. Thank you very much.